Great. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, welcome to another exciting uh, virtual coffee hour hosted by the ASA Peace, War, and Social Conflict section. Um, my name is Mika Sremak. For those who don't know me, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota. And today we're really excited to welcome Dr. Jeffrey Haas from the University of Richmond, who will be presenting insights from his new book, Wartime Suffering and Survival, The Human Condition Under Siege in the Blockade of Leningrad, 1941 to 1944. We're really excited to hear from you, Jeff. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks, Tika. Thanks to you and Sherzat for the invitation. Um, and those of you who are here or, or who will be listening to the, watching the video later on, my appreciation. Hope hope you learned something from this. Hope this is, will be will be a, a, a good use of your time. Um, I'll just kind of go over the book quickly and then, you know, whatever you want to know, talk about and talk about um, a little bit of background. This um could have been a dissertation topic back in the 90s, and I chose to do something else. Um, eventually came back to it, partly at the invitation of a good friend and colleague who's one of the world's experts on the blockade. Um, 2001, started reading diaries, had to take a hiatus, and then got back to it in 2007. And between diaries and state and party documents from all kinds of political, institutional, social positions, just got drawn in to what was an incredible and um, heroic and horrific drama. Um, so much of the social sciences uses as its empirical referent sites and moments when institutions and structures are fairly stable. And so the contentious politics would be in the context of that stability but what happens to us as social actors when there's a lot less certainty when those institutions and structures could be on their last legs so um just i didn't go into this with like one set research question it was let's explore and then slowly but surely how does one make sense of the patterns of survival of everyday practice that were emerging um, and there's a dialogue of sorts um, going on with the events um, themselves. And something I learned from my mentors, John Markoff, Miguel Centeno, others, is that you should engage the event, to tell a story, you know, take the event on its own terms. Um, so a lot of the book is being driven in this kind of dialogue with Leningraders, um, but also in a dialogue with some bigger issues, such as in sociology, but in the social sciences, one that continues to animate me is rational choice versus Bourdieu. I started graduate school in the first half of the 90s. You're all too... Well, mercifully, you guys didn't have to go through all of that, <laughs> although Kimberly might remember a little bit of this, because she really might be a year or two behind me, that there was a moment in time when, you know, rat choice was making inroads and Bourdieusians were pushing back. So I'm still caught up in in that struggle between these two frameworks and is there a synthesis that would come out of it? Um, but you know, just kind of reading through the material and wanting to do something on the blockade. I only have three slides, so don't worry. Um, basically, as, as I worked through this stuff, kind of four big sets of themes and questions emerged and they're interdisciplinary. Um, the first and the last are a little more social science-y. Um, one of which is in this kind of situation, um, who are we? What's the nature of individual identity and interests and calculations and social relations? What happens to all of this when our backs are against the wall? Are we truly homo economicus? As Bourdieu himself actually seemed to suspect. Um, and to what extent does the social still matter? And on the other side of things, um, systemic collapse and resilience. Um, how is it that collective practices can endure? Um, how do they mutate? How are they reproduced? Especially under moments of intense duress. There are also a set of issues that are more area studies oriented, more of a dialogue with historians. First, Leningraders own voices and their own experiences, in particular relating to the self versus the social. 
something I think that can kind of get lost in historians' accounts, and they're the ones who tend to dominate this particular topic. And at the same time, for this particular spot in time, what did war do to the political institutions and the fields and the political culture of Bolshevism? Um, interestingly, a social, historical, political phenomenon that's not sufficiently on the radar of sociology as a discipline. I mean, let's face it, the roots of sociology and socialism kind of begin in a similar spot. And uh, as a discipline, we don't take this great experiment as seriously as we should. And this was an important test of, of socialism, Soviet style. It's a Gettysburg, um, as it were. So these kind of are the, the themes and questions as they start to crystallize um, as I was writing the book and they kind of became the focus. So, I don't know, let me take a few minutes and just kind of go over what the book's about. And this is kind of what the chapter structure looks like, part one, part two, part three, two chapters per part. And they don't reflect kind of this a priori research design. And the research design, and I know any of my methods colleagues are going to be wanting to kick me in the shins when they hear this. The research design kind of came out of this um dialogue with the experiences of the Leningraders. So the different themes that emerge were ones that were significant to them, either in their conscious reflections on them or just in the sheer quantity of materials they left in interviews, diaries, et cetera, um, behind. So the, the first part are, is about social order. What happens to social relations? Our sense of being connected, of loyalty, of orientation, um, when our backs are against the wall. And let me step back for a second and kind of foreground this. Um, I talked about Leningrad as this moment of duress. Um, just to give you an idea of what it was, this is 872 days where the city is surrounded by the Wehrmacht, mostly Finns in the north. Hard to get things in and out of the city. Um, in the winter of 1941-42, um, rations hit their nadir. Imagine getting a half of a loaf of bread as the maximum ration for the day, a bread that's lost its nutritive value. Um, maybe you get hold of some chocolate or some pasta, um, but the caloric intake is not enough to sustain life over time. Um, in addition, you're expending energy by shivering, going to work, walking from store to store to markets, etc. cetera. Um, and there's bombs and shells falling from the sky. One of them might have your name on it. Um, who will die from starvation or starvation-related illness tomorrow or in the next few days. Um, it's facing mass death in the face. Um, and in fact, mass death will begin to crest in December of 1941 as rations just plummet and it becomes difficult to survive. Perhaps a million people, civilians, will die, um, which just dwarfs a lot of measures of, of, of death and casualties even from major conflicts. So what do people do in all of this? How do they survive? So part one looks at relations of order when the real battle isn't Leningraders versus the Germans, it's Leningraders versus the second law of thermodynamics. Um, how do you keep your body from falling apart, let alone the social order? And hiding behind this is kind of rat choice inspired. The incentive is to think about yourself uh, when survival is at stake. Don't worry about the repressive apparatus, the NKVD, the secret police, die from firing squad because you've broken the law or die versus starvation. You try to break the law to survive. Um, your close loved ones versus you, well, when you're really hungry, um, those stomach pains will claim your loyalty. So kind of, I guess, the null hypothesis is you should have institutional and social decay, a kind of a move towards a Hobbesian uh, state. Um, and looking at the macro and the micro, looking at state institutions, kind of broader structures and smaller structures of family and community, what is it that happens? What's fascinating is that there is at the macro level decay. And in fact, there's so much going on here that I couldn't fit it into one book. I'm working on the sequel right now, which dives into this whole macro question. It's huge and really complicated. So there's a whole lot more going on this, you know, than in one chapter. But um, Cadre's officials who have who have proximity to food 
will start stealing it and selling it on the black market, in the shadow market, as it's called, where desperate lending writers will go and trade whatever they possibly can, money, uh, gold watches, pictures. If you have a piano, pianos, I'm, I'm not kidding. People would trade pianos for food. Trade whatever they could. And this creates this interesting situation of dual power almost, kind of Trotsky's idea of dual power in revolutions. That on the one hand, you got formal institutions of provision, especially food. It was a method of Soviet social control, as well as legitimating the welfare state versus the rise of a market in the shadows of and drawing on that formal state-centered economy, um, creating dual loyalty, as it were. The average civilians are, on the one hand, oriented towards getting rations from the state and going to the black market, which is drawing on food from the state, undercutting state capacity, as it were. This should sound like a recipe for decay. It should sound like a recipe for disorder. And in fact, the state does start to lose some of this uh, social control over its civilians. But interestingly, it actually leads to a new equilibrium of stability, partly because the regime figures out if we let people, you know, thieves and civilians work out survival, it keeps people alive. They're able to go work in factories. It keeps them from becoming too desperate and it maintains a degree of stability. So interestingly, from this kind of dual power scenario, we don't get further breakdown. We get some devolution, but a slowing of decay. And that helps maintain order, interestingly. Um, this opens up the possibility for markets and hierarchies, which I didn't pursue too much in this, and which I'm still kind of thinking through now. But that old that that old issue, again, from the 1990s of markets and hierarchies, um, comes very much alive here, and it's very complicated. When you get to the micro level of communities, families especially, um, you get this interesting tension. On the one hand, between this urge to be opportunistic, to steal food from anyone you can in order to survive. And you do have cases of this, whether it's people stealing bread from other people in bread lines, um, whether it is one civilian promising another, give me your ration cards, I'll run to the store, get your rations and come back. Well, you can imagine what might happen there. Take somebody's ration cards, take their food and then disappear. So you have examples of opportunism and you even have examples of families um, undergoing severe tension over competition for food. And I tell one story from one woman's really detailed diary about this. But interestingly, what happens more often is um, that the closer one is, the, the less the social distance, the greater the likelihood of observing suffering up close. And that creates empathy. And empathy in this case leads to sympathy and that mitigates against opportunistic behavior. So one pattern that one sees this more local level is that even though you've got the most opportunity to steal from your family, it is this sympathy with someone else who's suffering that prevents that from happening at least to any large scale. On the other hand, if someone is a faceless bureaucrat, you've got no problem stealing from the warehouse. Uh, if someone is a stranger on the street, you might be more likely to pull for their ration cards, especially if they're dead, even if they're alive. So there's something about social distance, social structure, and empathy at the local level that contributes to whether or not we get this Hobbesian state of all versus all, or some degree of social cooperation. Um, one side story to this is um, the redefinition of food. Um, as you can imagine, when rations are too low for survival and you might not be able to get enough food on the black market because you don't have enough to trade, what do you eat instead? Well, belts, because belts are made of leather. Uh, binders glue, another glue, you can mix it and create a glue jelly. Um, okay, Kim, if you're eating your lunch, you might want to like turn away for a second. Um, dogs, cats, and human flesh. Um, what becomes interesting is the symbolically, the closer that entity is to being a human being, the less people are likely to eat it. So a belt, glue, they're inanimate, they're fair game. Um, interestingly, it seems Leningraders are more likely to eat dogs than cats. Um, eating cats becomes close to crossing the Rubicon. And I have one case of someone who killed herself after having eaten cats. As a cat person, I can understand this sense of distance. <laughs> um, the funny thing about cannibalism is we should have seen more cases of it.
Um, and there are cases of cannibals. But one interesting part of the discourse of diaries is people write about it all the time and reflect upon it as that ultimate Rubicon that should not be crossed. Because once people become cannibals, they stop being people. What are we suffering and fighting for? So cannibalism kind of becomes this, this symbolic moment in people's own reflections in their diaries about how far one cannot go. Um, but again, what can be eaten, what can be redefined in, as food, um, in part is a function of symbolic distance. The more distant something is, the more likely one is to, is to eat it. And that maintains a sense of order. So even amongst this incredible duress, there's something about social distance, observation, empathy that maintains order. Um, and one way I've tried to explain this is that there are, in particular, other entities outside of us, maybe real or virtual, I call them anchors, um, which I drew from economics literature, into which we invest a sense of ourself. Um, and their well-being becomes part of our own habit, identity, habitus, interest, utility function, call it whatever you will. And so part of our own survival will involve the survival of this other entity because it is who we are, which is an idea I actually got from Gary Becker and his definition of love. Um, just as a nice one minute aside, Gary Becker defines love as follows. M sub I loves F sub J if F sub J's well-being is part of M sub I's utility function. Beautiful economies. And then Becker actually then proceeds to dismiss or ignore his own insight. But think of it, your utility function is dependent upon a living other. A social relation becomes um, reproduced in part by a definition of self and one's own interest. This becomes important for part two, um, unequal suffering, unequal survival, gender and class. Um, let me jump ahead to class really quickly for a second. As it turns out, survival strategies and reflection upon suffering and survival do seem to map fairly well onto class. Um, interestingly, the more privileged intelligentsia, um, professors, scientists, artists, people like that, they will use privilege because they have insider access to maybe additional food. They have more stuff they can sell in the market, et cetera. They don't talk about privilege, but they tend to use it. On the other hand, they do not like to use black markets because the black market shadow markets are very much out of Econ 101. And Econ 101, for someone who's educated and has a sense of cultural capital, seems profane. It's beneath them. And so they are very, the intelligentsia are very critical of using markets to survive and often won't turn to them until it's too late. And in fact, I cite cases of people who didn't turn to it and eventually died. Um, workers, on the other hand, are very um, critical of privilege. This is the USSR, class society, and yet managers have better access to food than workers, what gives? Um, but they are more willing to use the black market without much comment on it. To the extent they're critical, it's of speculative prices. Otherwise, get our rations from the state, from ration coupons, get our food from trading on the black market, doesn't really matter. Um, workers have become cynical enough after the 1930s that this is all about pragmatic survival. So cultural capital, pragmatism come very much alive in these different class houses. Gender has become everyone's favorite chapter. Um, I'll just go over this really, really quickly. The, the city has been feminized because a lot of men are either at the front or they're the first to die. Um, this has part to do with metabolism. Um, women have a little more body fat than men, so they're able to survive for a little bit longer. Eventually, women's death rates will catch up to men, and that's but that's kind of at the tail end of the first winter. So the city's feminized if men are at the front or are dying. And because a woman's habitus at this time um, is oriented towards habits of care, caregiving. Women take it upon themselves to save the city, which either meant going into factories and taking men's positions or upping the game of finding scarce food and then using it to stretch out um, feeding for entire families. And when you think about it, it, this kind of makes sense. 1930s women have to deal with not only the first shift work, but the second shift. Um, work at home. And so they've got the skills, they've got the, the, the gendered habitus to feel compelled to do this. And when they see families under threat, they do what women were compelled to do in the 1930s, find scarce materials, use them wisely, use them economically. And so it's because of women that the city survives. 
Interestingly, women notice this and they start complaining about how men are useless because men are dying um, earlier. This myth arises that the way to stay av- the way to stay alive is to keep moving. Now, any of you who remember physics, second law of thermodynamics, that's actually not the way to survive. You want to conserve energy. But you can see the empirical observation. Women are more active. They're not dropping like flies like men are. So the problem is there's something about men's norms, men's attitudes. They give in to suffering too easily. They lay down and die. Women are more active, helping everyone survive. That's how you survive. And women actually become highly critical of men. Um, And what this does is this reinforces this sense of gender as essential, as essentialist, not socially constructed, not political, um, but the gender difference, not just sex, but gender differences, the roles are natural. And when the chips are down, it's women's roles that become more important. Women raise the status of these gendered women's roles, which in the end further reproduces and re-entrenches the sense of a gender divide of gender difference. Um, so it's fascinating how gendered habitus, in this sense, actually contributes to survival, but then reproduces the gendered habitus in the moment of duress. And I've, interestingly, I've seen other cases of this elsewhere in the Civil War, um, in Sarajevo, and I'm seeing some work come out on Ukraine since 2014, which shows this gender division of labor that contributes to this reproduction of gender essentialism. <clears throat> now, I've talked about survival in the face of collapse and just the amazing things that people were able to do to survive. Despite that, there is mass death, up to a million people dead. Um, there's a mass set of mass graves in one cemetery where around 500,000 people are buried. It's just enormous. It's depressing. Putin uses it for political purposes, etc. cetera. Um, and so mass death was the flip side to survival. Um, and how did people cope with this? Um, Chapter six looks at the different strategies and your the strategies and practices of coping with mass death actually depended upon one's field position and relation to the dead. Within the state, the dead were viewed as this violation of social order, aesthetics, and discipline. And so they had to be disposed of pragmatically, which usually meant things like mass graves, cremation. Um, for those who were doing the labor of disposing of the dead, Um, This was a gruesome, difficult job, but what did Soviet labor do in order to survive? You barter your labor um, for some kind of additional gain, kind of a shadow economy of sorts. And so what grave diggers would do is in the midst of digging mass graves, for example, they would barter um, digging an individual grave for civilians in return for, say, bread, rubles, vodka. There's also a field of intimacy, families, for example. And if the dead were a loved one, you might actually sacrifice some of your food to give them a dignified farewell. That is, there's, especially for civilians, this becomes really stark. When someone, a a parent, a sibling dies, what do you do with them? Do you just leave them at a collection point so they're given in a mass grave? That's a loss of dignity, which is pretty horrific. Do you dig a mass grave for them, put together a coffin? That's a lot of work, a lot of energy. Do you pay someone to dig an individual grave for them? That's sacrificing um food what you could use to survive in order to pass on dignity and the amazing thing is a lot of leningraders will sacrifice and some will die in order to give this last bit of dignity to someone who was not a statistic like for the state or this lump of matter to be thrown into the ground like for disposal labor rather it was still some kind it wasn't a bureaucratic entity it was still a real entity still this anchor of connection of identity So dealing with death is partly calculation, um, but it's partly this sense of kind of field embedded meaning, Um, which leads to the last chapter, Theodicies, how to make sense of all of this. Um, And the practice of finding meaning and meaninglessness is um, this search in part for community who are fellow sufferers and a search for who is to blame. And interestingly, kind of symbolic and social distance plays a role here as well. Those who are visibly visibly suffering in the city, they are part of um, a community of sufferers, especially those who are authentically suffering, people who are truly starving. The Red Army are also a community of authentic sufferers. They get legitimacy in the grand scheme of things. 
Interestingly, in making sense of a new cosmology, Stalin and the Bolshevik party are left out of the conversation. Um, the real heroes and the real sufferers are civilians, soldiers, and others who don't have privilege. I think there's an interesting undercurrent here for the building of nation that I have not explored. That's kind of part of the sequel. Kind of had to leave it go at that point. But something interesting in finding um, the sense of empathy that I talked about earlier, it comes back in making sense of who are the good guys, who are the bad guys who are to blame. The Germans are to blame, obviously. But they're also the furthest away. It's easy to impose on this kind of distant, abstract German face, this faceless entity, total blame for all of the suffering. Bureaucrats, you run into them on a regular basis, but you don't know them personally. You can't blame them as much as Germans for all the suffering, but bureaucrats are making decisions. They're cold. Um, they are to blame as well. Um, so when all is said and done, after all of the suffering, Leningraders come out with a sense of um, there is or there are communities that deserve dignity. And one of the tragedies that comes out of the blockade is the suffering of civilians doesn't get the recognition that it should afterwards, because that would have, that would lead to questions about how did the regime let this happen. Soldiers, on the other hand, will get um, the lion's share of, of status and legitimacy afterward, creating this interesting divide between the two. So when all said and done, this is kind of a, been a quick overview of the story. Um, some of the takeaways that I got from this is um, the human spirit is quite resilient um, and innovative, but innovations are embedded, first of all, in social and symbolic distance. Something I got from John Martin's work, he tends to talk about visibility in fields. Um, in fact, his metaphor for fields is a field of vision. Um, what we observe actually does affect us, and it does shape our sense of connectedness, of embeddedness. Um, and belonging. And being able to see suffering up close ends up creating a social glue that provides a backstop against the Hobbesian state of nature. So that has been one takeaway of all of this. The second is when is we do calculate, uh, Peter and Sorokin wrote about starvation um, and the decay of norms, and he's partly right, but not entirely right, that this close other entity, children, siblings, maybe the nation or the city, when they become sufficiently part of our identity and sense of self, we are actually willing to sacrifice um, as a rule to defend those others. So this is another backstop um, against the Hobbesian state of nature. And one thing that might work for resilience is that when a social system comes under assault, um, there might be some devolution of authority. There might be an initial stage of of, of decay from higher level systems to maybe lower level systems in terms of decision making. But ultimately the local becomes very important as a grounding for social order and social structure. Such that I think one way of rethinking things like revolutions is to focus um, not on so much total collapse as devolution and a reemergence of these more empathy-oriented um, local communities, a takeaway from John Markov's work in the French Revolution in particular. So I'm seeing echoes of what I'm doing in, in some of the work John has done. So I think when we talk about things like resilience and suffering, um, the social of fields and of habits matter. It's just the fields that begin to matter more will be local fields. And the habits and habitus that will begin to matter are those habits and senses of self that are linked to these closer others. And there is a micro sociology that Randall Collins likes to talk about that I think activates um, even more so once our backs are against the wall and it seems that broader or abstract institutions can be called into question. So this is kind of, I probably talked too much. Um, this is kind of the overview of some of what this has been about in the lessons. And so um, what do you wanna know? <laughs> Jeff, thank Thanks you so for... much. This was actually like a really succinct overview of the book. So I really appreciate that we got to get all of these insights from it. Um, we can open it up to questions. I will just uh, stop the recording so that we can feel free to do that. Thank you again, Jeff.